We want to thank everyone for joining us for our weekly Dermatology Education Foundation video series. As a reminder for all nurse practitioners and physician assistants, please continue to follow the guidance provided by your practices, your supervising physicians, or your collaborative agreements, and your state licensing boards. In addition, we urge you to follow the mandates and direction provided to you by your state and local governments. As a reminder, this video series is for educational purposes and is not an accredited series. Tonight, we will continue our discussion on the relevant changes in communication and patient interactions in this new era and constantly changing era of dermatology and telemedicine during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, we're honored to be joined by our um, guests, Dr. Orit Markowitz, who is the Director of Pigmented Lesions and Skin Cancer at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and Associate Professor of Dermatology at Mount Sinai Medical Center, and Associate Professor of Dermatology at Downstate Medical Center. We're also joined by my friend and Derm 2020 faculty member, Dr. George Kehoe, who's gonna share his experiences from his large Tennessee-based dermatology practice, the Knoxville Dermatology Group. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you, Joe, glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I wanna um, also mention um, and thank DermTech, who is a sponsor of a portion of tonight's presentation. DermTech has created a non-surgical, non-invasive adhesive patch and platform that's based on precision genomic technology called the DermTech PLA. This is extremely pertinent to us today as we're all thrust into teledermatology because the DermTech PLA is designed to provide greater accuracy and earlier detection of melanoma. The reason it's uh, pertinent for us in teledermatology specifically today is because this melanoma test can be performed in patients' homes via teledermatology as prescribed by nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and dermatologists. Dr. Markowitz is gonna show us how this works and provide additional insights about her experiences with melanoma detection via dermatology, via, I'm sorry, via, via teledermatology. So as we try and add more tools to our virtual lab coats, taking care of patients in front of the laptop as opposed to the bedside, I think this is a great, a great asset for us to have. So we will post a summary of the resources that we discussed this evening on the blog page of our website, dermnppa.org, and some housekeeping notes. While we have all the participants muted during the call, hopefully, fingers crossed, with a, no Zoom bombers this evening, uh, please do keep your questions coming. You can send them uh, through the chat function on the uh, Zoom group chat to our host, Stacy Moore, and we'll try and get to them at the end of the presentation. So Dr. Kehoe, thanks again for joining us. As we understand, the Knoxville Dermatology Group will be reopening to full speed this coming Monday. So we really like to hear a little bit about what your practice looks like today in terms of uh, preparation for the new normal. And I also understand your practice has a whole new look. So perhaps you can sort of walk us through and uh, let us get a, take a peek at the safety measures and precautions that you and your staff have put in place to usher in patients uh, as they return to clinic. Absolutely, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Tennessee, by uh, governor's order, is going to reopen tomorrow, May 1st. Uh, we're glad uh, to be in business uh, tomorrow, but also on Monday, and we expect it to really take off. Our clinic has really been, uh, at, we've stayed open during the entire crisis, but a very low staffing and very low patient population, probably only 10 to 20% of normal on some days in terms of patient load. Uh, providers have stayed around working shorter hours than previous. Uh, we have two most surgeons. One of them uh, decreased his cases to zero. The other one minimized it, just taking care of uh, painful, aggressive, disfiguring, or significant lesions. So we've been really uh, quiet during the last few weeks. However, with the announcement from our governor about reopening, uh, we've taken steps to uh, hopefully have a smooth transition back uh, to a fuller practice. 
we have some slides and I'm gonna demonstrate some of the things that uh, we've initiated anticipating uh, reopening. Uh, this is, we have multiple entrances to our clinic. This is the back door and a fire uh, stairway. Here we have staff screening. All staff members must enter through the same door. Uh, upon entering, you see one of my assistants with a thermometer in her hand. You'll have a temperature scan. If you're over 100 degrees, you're going home for the day. Uh, and then your temperatures are recorded on a sheet to make sure that uh, we're not going to punish anybody for being 99 degrees. However, making sure we're not seeing an error or an uh, upswing or downswing in the uh, thermometer itself. It's been pretty stable. We've been happy. Uh, we cleanse the thermometer in between applications to our foreheads. Uh, we also then, when, once you have a temperature that's acceptable, one of those orange stickers will be put on your clothing, letting other staff members know you've been checked. So we have one way in, one way out for the staff. If you're over 100 degrees, you also go into that pit just behind the desk and you stay there until uh, you recover. Uh, you go to the next slide, please. Um, the patient entrance, this sign is front and center at several, uh, several locations on the door itself, so they really can't miss it. We're only uh, allowing patients in by themselves unless they really need assistance uh, for physical or mental status. Family members, visitors, please wait in the vehicle. This is the south. We'll get six people come in because grandma has a spot on her arm and they have a picnic in our waiting room. So we have to really cut down on that to really uh, maximize social distancing. You can go to the next slide. Also, we have this for the patients. Before they enter, we give them a chance to stop, hence the stop sign. If they're experiencing any flu-like symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, or have traveled over the last 14 days out of the U.S. or on a cruise, or have had close contact with a COVID-19 patient, we ask them to return home and call to reschedule. We've had this up for a while, but it's going to be a big impact when people start showing up en masse tomorrow. You go to the next slide. Upon entering, this is, we have a... Uh, kind of a pre-waiting room area. We have one of our staff members there uh, taking temperatures on each of the patients as they come in. Uh, then we hand them a questionnaire. We have clean pens and dirty pens, and we ask them questions. Also, we'll provide the patients with a mask if they don't have one, if they feel they need one, uh, or they or uh, would just like to have one for the, um, uh, for the appointment themselves. So we do screen them here. Anyone over 100 degrees, we ask them to return, return home, contact their primary care provider. So far, we've not had anybody have to do that. You can go to the next slide. And this is the questionnaire we give the patient, asking if they're experiencing any illness with fever, cough, shortness of breath, body aches, et cetera, uh, or have they been recovered uh, from COVID-19? So this is a little questionnaire to give us further information on the patient. Upon doing this and signing the form, they proceed into our waiting area, check-in. We have seven check-in stations in our waiting room. We have put up the plexiglass to protect both our staff and the patient from the possibility of any, uh, any transmission uh, through any exhaled products, uh, breathing, otherwise. We also have Purell uh, that, is that is put on the counters. Patients can wash their hands. You can see a close-up of it right there. We also ask the patients to stay behind the glass instead of stuffing stuff in between the plexiglass, rather go underneath as you would at a bank teller's office. Once the patients check in, we, this is one of our seating areas. We have separated their seating areas by six feet. So we've taken out just about every other chair in the waiting room to accommodate social distancing. Uh, you can see against the back wall, we have a double chair and we've marked all of those off limits uh, since that gets to obviously very, very close together. So we've decreased our capacity in our waiting room greatly. And then upon finishing the exam, we have one way out for the patients. This is a fire exit that is adjacent to the front door you see off to the left side. The patients have one way in and one way out, so there's no cross-contamination uh, of patients as they're coming and going through the clinic. And the patients are very receptive of this. We put uh, markers on the floor, as you can see on that last slide, so patients don't get lost. The patients feel very secure in this environment. We also have, we have a meta spa. It opens tomorrow, but it's been closed. Uh, but we also put this up there so patients don't come in looking for the meta spa on our second floor. So they see that, they turn around. So again, minimizing traffic through the clinic. Uh, we also have posted this throughout the clinic, what steps we are taking to protect our patients. And I think the patients value this. I'd let them know what we're doing. We're taking this seriously, protecting them. I think the fact that we have given them masks if they don't have one, uh, they feel very good about that. So they feel safe coming into our clinic. 
the staff has gone through extraordinary measures to make the clinic as clean as possible and as safe as possible. You can see the things that have been done. However, we had, we've added on with the, with the opening coming that all patients, uh, sorry, the current background, uh, so the signage makes the patients feel very secure. Uh, my printer's going off, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and also, any public areas, bathrooms, shared areas, we, like a restaurant, have put signs on the door itself, letting them know what hours it's been cleaned. And we clean these every one to two hours throughout the day, to min uh, in that way to minimize any possible transmission through common area, common areas of high touching. We also have uh, eliminated all outside vendors. Uh, pharmaceutical representatives are not coming in. There are no lunches being delivered. Uh, so we've really cut down on transmission of possible, possible virus through limiting access to the clinic to many people. We no longer have magazines in the waiting room. Uh, we no longer have trial size uh, samples of lotion in the waiting room. And we have no snacks in our Moe's waiting area, which we used to have. So we've minimized of that, minimized all of that. We look forward to reopening, but my, as part of the reopening, you really need administrative oversight of the regulations. The governor uh, allowed for opening to take place on May 1st. However, six counties of the 95 in Tennessee were exempted from that, Knox County, where I live, being one of them. We have our own health department, so the requirements are different in terms of, of reopening. So administrative staff has to be very, very alert of what state of federal regulations, state regulations, and then even local regulations that may vary uh, from within a, within a county itself. Uh, Knoxville is in the city is in the county of Knox. However, Knox County has a different mayor than the city of Knoxville. It gets to be very confusing. So we've, what we've done, we have reopened our meta spa in accordance uh, with Tennessee statutes starting May first. It will be limited capacity. So we're opening the meta spa. Uh, we had closed our practice to all but urgent or emergent cases. It's very difficult to ascertain which is which uh, or if something's really emergent. Uh, however, we're now going to open up to regular appointments. We had decreased our Mohs surgical capacity I mentioned earlier to just critical cases, disfiguring, painful, aggressive tumors, or perhaps melanoma, uh, depending on the Mohs uh, uh, surgeon judgment. However, now cases will be uh, booked that are no longer of those more critical subtypes. Uh, elective surgeries, uh, cyst, dysplastic nevi, or ugly nevi, uh, that we will be doing those once again. Uh, providers during the crisis and even now have gone to wearing scrubs as opposed to uh, shirts, ties, and even getting rid of our lab coats. I think that's, the patients appreciate that. They say we're cycling through clean, uh, in very clean scrubs, no lab coats. Uh, the patients appreciate that also. Today, it was a 50% increase over the number of patients I saw yesterday. I went from 10 to 20. Uh, patients are getting ready to come back. Tomorrow on my schedule, I have 30. Uh, the next week, it goes back to full, which is closer to 40 to 45 patients. So I do think upon reopening, the patients are anxious to come back. Uh, it's going to take some coordination with our administrative staff. Uh, we're still, we, we still must maintain the social distancing in the waiting room. We're going to have patients uh, come in. If the waiting room is at capacity, we're going to have them wait in their cars. We're going to contact them through cell phone. Uh, patients have a chart filled out, a piece of paper that's placed in a box with my name on it or another provider's name. When a medical assistant pulls the chart from the box, if there is no cell phone number on it, that means the patient is in the waiting room and we call them directly. Uh, if there's a cell phone number, we call them on the cell phone to bring them into the clinic. We made accommodations for people without cell phones. We have a separate area for them. We'll place them. Uh, and that hopefully that will decrease the, uh, cr the capacity issue we'll have in our waiting room. We also are, are talking about staggering our appointments. Uh, Wednesdays are very busy days in our clinic. It may be necessary to put some providers on a different schedule, working perhaps noon till 8 p.m. as opposed to regular hours. So we're going to really try to get inventive uh, with the hours that we're working to minimize number of patients perhaps being overflowed into their cars uh, during this time. I do think the patients will be coming back in large numbers. I've seen that surge already in my schedule, and I hope that is a good trend for taking care of our patients and getting back to full speed.
Thank you, George. Yeah, this, um, the challenge of the, not just the medical aspect of caring for the patients, but the logistics of getting that volume of patients in and out of the office is like going to be a chess match for all of us um, in the, where we are, you know, in Tennessee and in California, we have big parking lots. It may not be as hard to do that in the city. Uh, the cities, downtown San Francisco, downtown New York, that's going to present a much more difficult chess match of uh, social distancing. So thank you for those insights. So please submit your questions for uh, Dr. Kehoe to the chat box and we'll uh, address them uh, at the conclusion as we have time. Uh, but I would like to move on uh, to Dr. Markowitz um, and just take a few moments uh, prior to her presentation to discuss uh, the important and emerging COVID-19 related findings. Um, Dr. Markowitz is the, as the director of the pigmented lesions and skin cancer at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, uh, there was a recent publication uh, by one of your colleagues at Mount Sinai in the New England of Journal, New England Journal of Medicine just this Tuesday that discusses five COVID-19 patients in their 30s and 40s who all developed a, re, acute ischemic large vessel stroke. So for two of the cases, the stroke was the presenting symptom. Can you just briefly comment on that paper uh, before we transition into the rest of the presentation? Sure, it would be my pleasure. Um, so basically what we've been seeing uh, for some time now in terms of skin manifestations, and I know you've uh, extensively reviewed these skin manifestations, I think we're now connecting some of the other findings to understand a little bit more about the pathophysiology of these skin manifestations because we are seeing vasculopathy and vasculitity type of skin findings. And we're also seeing that the medications, we have a clinical trial as well at Mount Sinai uh, with many of our psoriasis and atopic dermatitis patients who are on um, various biologics to see what the impact is on them in terms of COVID-19 because we're also trialing these drugs uh, for treatment. And so we're starting to see these connections. And of course, with healthy young individuals, who often won't present with symptoms of their you know, respiratory uh, shortness of breath and so forth and end up being somewhat asymptomatic, the thought is could they have something like, for example, in lupus where you have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And I think the skin manifestations often can help us diagnose, uh, especially with young individuals. So, I've been urging patients that have, ha that have subtle rashes, especially on the extremities, um, to very much consider uh, having either a live or a teloderm visit um, to make sure that we don't in fact need to test them. Because in many parts of the country, there are still protocols for testing uh, and we're not as accessible with asymptomatic individuals. That's an issue that we're all experiencing around the country is that the protocols for being tested uh, are not, be the threshold for being tested uh, oftentimes is too high for a patient that has a skin manifestation to qualify by their primary care provider, by their insurance um, company to allow them to be tested. So hopefully um, through more programs like this and further education and publication, um, that would be a primary reason for uh, testing. So just a few housekeeping notes. Um, we have posted in the Zoom, in the Zoom chat uh, the PLA uh, teledermatology handout, um, as well as the article uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so Dr. Marquis, thank you for taking time to address that. Now we're going to be discussing early detection of melanoma, uh, and we're specifically going to focus on teledermatology and our pigmented lesion assay. Uh, these are some relevant conflicts of interest. And uh, when I talk about early detection of melanoma, often I like to go through um, what are some of the new findings as of 2019, um, and things have been a bit on hold in 2020. So we have uh, better ways 
for doing more efficient exams. Uh, we have a variety of different technologies coming into the market, including uh, our ability to add teledermoscopy to our now teledermatology visit, as well as utilizing some of the artificial intelligence in enabling us to be more efficient at uh, seeing our patients. And so what we're going to focus on mostly today as well is better ways to diagnose. So when I discuss, for example, our pigmented lesion assay or epidermal genetic information retrieval system, I like to focus on uh, diagnosis. And basically here uh, we have multiple tools, not just our epidermal genetic information retrieval. So our first line in diagnosis in my office is dermoscopy. Um, I'm also, also utilizing various tools for optical biopsies, such as reflectance confocal microscopy, as well as for melanoma, vascular patterns with optical coherence tomography. I haven't yet started utilizing electric impedance spectroscopy, um, but that is also an additional device for early detection. So I'm going to be focusing mainly on the epiderm epidermal genetic information retrieval or the pigmented lesion assay. Uh, and so when I look at these various tools, for example, just our clinical exam, followed by dermoscopy, then confocal microscopy, and we see that as we increase our sensitivity, our ability not to miss melanoma, our specificity as sometimes will go down. So when we have our different specificity and sensitivity for tests in terms of diagnosing melanoma, when you look at the clinical exam, uh, you can see that we have pretty good sensitivity and specificity. As we add our dermatoscope, that improves. Um, with reflectance confocal microscopy, we're also having um, certain sensitivity and specificity, but if you add all of these tools together, you're gonna have more accuracy when we're diagnosing our patient. Uh, and so here we have also pigmented lesion assay, which I'll be focusing on and the various ranges, electrical impedance spectroscopy, even high definition optical coherence tomography. So when I'm thinking about various tools, part of what's important to me is, are the patients gonna have to pay for these procedures? Reflectance confocal microscopy and pigmented lesion assay are covered by many insurances. So my patients are not gonna to have to pay for these things out of pocket. Um, of course, the clinical and dermoscopic exam, while technically is not covered by insurance, it is part of what we do as dermatologists and becomes covered in our care as well. But electrical impedance spectroscopy and optical coherence tomography are not covered by insurance at this time. What I appreciate about pigmented lesion assay testing is also what is the number needed to biopsy or what is the ratio of how often we're diagnosing melanoma and are we doing it accurately. And this test actually has an excellent biopsy ratio 1.7 to 1. I mean, that's, I think, in terms of what's reported in the literature, very similar to leading pigmented experts in their ability to diagnose melanoma. So that's very exciting. Now, what is a pigmented lesion assay test? So basically, we're utilizing an adhesive and we're placing it on a mole and we're sending it in for information. And we have many peer-reviewed manuscripts. We have our coverage for this technology. Um, we have a code for this procedure. And we have a, a very good accuracy because our negative predictive value is 99%. So we can feel fairly certain if something is positive, we need to be managing it. And especially now with teledermatology and not wanting to necessarily always bring our patients in, especially as our practices need to be servicing them even as they reopen, not at the same volume. It's nice to have tools that we can help in screening them. And certainly as eventually we op reopen, hopefully in New York City, we will be utilizing our virtual visits very frequently in addition to inpatient exams because it's gonna be quite challenging to see everyone. 
uh, as you mentioned, uh, basically they can't wait for us in their cars. So we're, we're, we are gonna have to tailor our care and the virtual visit is gonna be really helpful. Um, when we're looking at our melanoma biopsy ratio, again, it's 1.7 to one, it's fantastic. Now, I like to thank one of my collaborators, Dr. Daniel Siegel, um, when I was giving this lecture and looking into uh, utilizing this technology, I also wanna make sure that I'm coding for it properly. Uh, he was very helpful and we have many applications, of course, in helping ensure that we're coding for things properly. Uh, what's wonderful about pigmented lesion assay is that it's covered for my patient and it also increases the complexity of my visit. For example, if I have a patient coming in with a history of melanoma and I'm concerned about a lesion potentially that could be melanoma, and if I'm now sending that patient for a laboratory test, which I am with the pigmented lesion assay, um, what does that mean in terms of my complexity level? And I have been able to often um, reach an established level four complexity um, when utilizing this technology and of course in the appropriate patients. So what do we do with our atypical mole patients, especially now that I'm seeing them virtually and they're young and they're high risk and we know that the statistics for melanoma in 2020 is that we're gonna lose one individual every hour of every day to melanoma. And that's in a normal year where we're able to see at full volume all of our patients. With the pigmented lesion assay test, they were able to utilize this technology, placing it on various lesions and obtaining um, the one that needs to be removed. The ugly duckling, which isn't always the darkest or most atypical. But I bring up this example because we also have to remember that we need to utilize additional tools because if a lesion is less than five millimeters, like for example, on that gentleman with a lot of large atypical moles, his 0.2 millimeter thick melanoma with this tiny mole here, I cannot use the pigmented lesion assay on this mole. It's too small, it's less than five millimeters, but I don't wanna miss it. Additionally, here's another young man with a very small mole on his leg and already only one month of age, this mole, because I had seen him a month ago and I have full body photography on him, the mole was not there. But in this month's time, look at what we have and it already has a blue white veil. What does that mean? It means that there's already depth to this lesion, perhaps a nodular melanoma in the making. So we need to utilize all tools when we're seeing patients Here's another young man with lots of large classic atypical mole syndrome type moles with a little pink papule. So we also know that amelanotic melanomas can be very rapidly growing and these are all very small lesions. I, my approach to dermoscopy, I've now been utilizing with teledermatology because I can now tell my patients what to look for. And often I'm telling them, please don't wait for the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma because then I potentially am gonna miss these early lesions, even on my virtual visit. I say, look for something that's flat or elevated. Is it dark? Can you feel it? Is it crusty? Is it new? Is it something that perhaps you didn't notice before? Is something starting to look more atypical? Um, and especially the pink panthers. So they're looking for these things at home in what I call a modified skin exam. And why? Because if something is pink and we're looking dermoscopically, these are all examples, not in situ, but all early amelanotic melanomas. Additionally, sorry, we'll move forward here. Um, we have, again, what am I using every day in my practice? So in addition to dermoscopy, I began using uh, tape stripping in my practice every day as I'm finding a lot of utility for this technology. And um, where am I using it? I'm using it with these larger lesions. For example, what if someone has a large atypical appearing pigmented lesion that's isolated. So often even without dermoscopy, these are the types of lesions we end up biopsying. But who wants a large biopsy in the middle of their nose if it's benign? 
So I often am using dermoscopy, but what if I see an annular granular pattern? Then what can I do? Now I'm gonna go and cut this lesion, but what if it's an, a pigmented actinic keratosis? So I have tape stripping. This can help me in defining whether this is something that absolutely needs to come off or can be monitored. In my office, I also have reflecting confocal microscopy so I can obtain an optical biopsy and then I can observe or even manage the patient. From home, I'm not utilizing confocal, but I'm utilizing everything else. How wonderful is that? So here's the instructions that patients receive on tape stripping. It's pretty straightforward, but I like to give them additional information, which I'll share shortly. So here's that example of that patient with that large pigmented lesion. Here we can see the dermoscopic findings. And basically you get these little ringlet structures, which are very concerning for melanoma, but can also be a pigmented actinic keratosis. Now my tape strip has low probability. In my office, um, I, I like to take optical biopsies as well until I absolutely trust every technology. And I've been very pleased with the correlation of the PLA along with my RCM or optical biopsy finding. But with a lesion like this, without these technologies, I would have been obligated to biopsy this lesion in its entirety. My co-chair of what was going to be the World Congress of um, Confocal Microscopy coming to New York with speakers from all around the world is Dr. Melissa Gill. I have her often as my second opinion as well for confocal microscopy. We will have that meeting next May and hopefully we'll have all the international speakers from everywhere, including Northern Italy and China and so forth. Um, but I'd like to credit uh, Dr. Gill here because she was helpful in providing the reports as I didn't wanna necessarily be biased with my findings and I really wanted to ensure with all of my early PLA tests that they were correlating with my optical biopsies. And in fact, uh, we correlated, found this to be a pigmented AK. This patient was treated for her actinic keratosis, and I've been following her up actually recently virtually with an excellent outcome, and she's very pleased, and that lesion was never cut. Here's another example, similar pigmented, greater than five millimeters, low probability on confocal, I mean, I'm sorry, on dermoscopy, you can find uh, these gray dots granules that can be with a lichen planus like keratosis, something that's uh, resolving, but often it can also be a sign of regression for melanoma or pigmented actinic keratosis. And in her case, it was similar that we could just follow the lesion. Now, what about with our ugly ducklings, right? Our dysplastic nevi, very large, patients coming in with lots of these lesions. We often biopsy. What if we just simply use PLA, and if we're not sure, we can short-term mole monitor. I use dermoscopy in my practice, um, but I'm also tape stripping these lesions and often find myself short-term mole monitoring them. I, I have my optical biopsy, I'm utilizing that as well, but again, none of these things are costing anything to my patient, and the more tools I have, the more sure I can be when I'm not cutting them. Here's an example of that mole. Uh, the patient had no idea in terms of duration, but the PLA was low probability. Uh, on dermoscopy, certainly made me nervous. Look at this very thick network. It, it's accentuated at the borders. Uh, and then on confocal microscopy, along with my second opinion, I feel very comfortable simply short-term mole monitoring as it became uh, clear that these are features of a compound dysplastic nevus with some atypia. Again. Another example, peripheral dots. Often you see that with growing or rubbed moles, but why should we go ahead and have to remove the lesion? PLA was, was low probability, but on dermoscopy, I'm certainly obligated to at least follow the lesion. Optical biopsy, very similar findings. So let's go ahead and short-term mole monitor the patient. Now, what can we do when our patients are home? Well, guess what? we can get them dermatoscope attachments to their iPhones. And we can do that with various companies. And it's costing them not, much, not that much more than the cost of a copay, which with our telederm visits are now often waived. 
And here is the video link that I'm sending my patients because we want to, of course, avoid our current estimates and always make them better that we don't lose an individual every hour of every day or more, God forbid, to melanoma this year. So this is the video that I send patients. Um, and then of course, with the visit, they are going to get instruction on how to utilize the technology. You can see you're placing the tape. You wanna make sure that you rub it well because, and that's what you're indicating to the patient. Um, also, they're gonna be provided with the marking pen. You wanna make sure that you're circling it close to the mole and not too far away. You remove, you see that there are some elements of the lesion, you place it firmly, and that's all they really need to do for their visit. But I will walk you through um, what is recommended. Now, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines are telling us to not bring in our patients unless it's something urgent. And what are we considering urgent? Well, they're saying hold off on managing skin cancer. Um, and obviously as we reopen, these guidelines become fluid and perhaps we will be able to manage many things. Um, but we're, they're even telling us at the moment, and especially in New York City, um, you get one chance. So if you think it's a melanoma, bring them in, they get an excisional biopsy. If it's in situ, they can wait. So this becomes so critical because I need to make sure that if I'm sending them in, that I'm sending them in for melanoma because they're gonna end up with a very large excisional biopsy at this point. So what does that mean? Well, I have tests that enable um, accurate ratios, right? I can do tape stripping. Now, how am I coding for my telehealth encounters? Well, um, according to, sure, I think we have some volume, so give me one second. I need that. Okay. Sorry. So basically, um, many states have parity laws where we're essentially coding very similarly as we would an in person visit. And this is really helpful, especially if we're seeing patients in person, but we cannot see the same volume. We can screen our patients and even help them virtually and not necessarily have to bring them in. Um, if they're Medicare patients, this is across state lines. Um, for our non-Medicare patients in New York, it's also similar with their insurances. Um, as well for our Medicare patients, we can uh, also code for the triaging and our non-Medicare patients, we have to list the number of minutes. Um, this is on the AED website. So uh, again, just reminding us with Medicare, we don't need to follow our HIPAA compliant regulations. So we can use a variety of different um, modalities to see our patients. With Apple phones, I like to use FaceTime with my Medicare patients, but if they don't have an Apple phone, we have WhatsApp video, we have Skype, uh, we can even utilize Zoom. And then if patients are not Medicare, we do have to follow HIPAA compliant guidelines. I like Google Meeting app, uh, which is a HIPAA compliant app at, at the healthcare level. Um, also, many EMRs, as you know, have uh, Mount Sinai, we have MyChart um, provide this. Zoom has a healthcare HIPAA compliant, uh, but it is quite pricey. I think it's uh, close to 200 a month, but it is an option. Uh, and then there's also, it's state and insurance dependent. So for example, I take care of Medicaid patients uh, in one of the city hospitals in Queens, which is currently the epicenter of all of uh, New York State coronavirus. So how am I managing these patients? Many of them don't have smartphones. Well, New York Medicaid allows pretty much uh, non-HIPAA compliant. So I can use WhatsApp if they do. Uh, I can even have a phone call and it's the same reimbursement as an established level visit, um, an ENM uh, coded visit for the Medicaid patients and I don't need to worry about HIPAA, I can do Zoom, whatever works for that patient so we can get them the care that they need. Um, this is the current, uh, this is on the American Telemedicine link. 
of state parity laws for private insurances. So you can see many states are in the orange. Of course, this is fluid and may change as we are allowed to reopen, but uh, it is important information because for some time, I'm going to have to be providing both even when we are allowed to reopen. Uh, so here's what the patient is receiving at home with the adhesive skin collection kit. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. What are we telling them? Well, first we have to schedule our visit and how wonderful that we can provide them for this for them in their home so that we can really ensure that if we're bringing them in for melanoma biopsy that it's in fact a melanoma. Uh, we can examine our patients. I'm utilizing both imaging and the virtual visit because I'm utilizing the dermoscopic images and clinical images and I send guidelines. So we're doing both in our exam to really hone in on what we need to be managing. Uh, and then certainly we can then evaluate and add the appropriate tools. So what do we need to do? In office, we request, you can submit that online. You create your own portal um, with the PLA testing. You can then schedule the patient for their test to arrive and I send a video link to my patient as well as have my staff, uh, my, my medical fellows, uh, help the patient to ensure that they're able to obtain the sample as it's clinician supervised or health staff, healthcare staff supervised, and then it gets delivered. So they collect it along with my staff, they package it, it gets shipped, and I get my result. It's simple. It's non-cutting, it's adhesive. They have plenty of instructions. They have an alcohol pad and a gauze to prep the skin. And they even have a pre-labeled FedEx and it's costing them nothing. It's covered by their insurance. I'm so grateful. Um, of course, the test gets analyzed. We receive the results through our portal. And then I either securely text securely email or call my patient with the result. And if there's further care, often we may even set up a follow-up visit in person or virtually right now in New York, mostly virtual. So Dr. Markowitz, just practically speaking, it seems like there's three components that uh, in our practice, what we're using is when we have the initial visit with the patient and identify a lesion, uh, then we have the kit sent to the patient. Once the patient receives the kit, um, they have access to a video link, but we often will get on the phone with them, which would be another, not on the phone, but we use Zoom in our office. So we would do a Zoom virtual visit, and then we have our third visit with them uh, virtually as well. Yes. Uh, those are all billable visits. Yes, and you, you actually are, you have to have a virtual visit um, to assist them with obtaining uh, the, the tape um, strip portion of it and sending it out. Uh, and certainly you can have a follow-up visit. Um, I am immediately giving them their results securely. Uh, and then you, you're saying that you're always having a follow-up visit. Um, certainly that is a billable uh, visit and you can have a virtual follow-up as well. Um, for the initial assessment visit, it, it also um, increases the complexity of the exam, uh, and so I'm coding for that as well. Yes. Thank you. So uh, the slide here is the contact information. Uh, we'll, I think we have this uh, as well. We'll make it accessible on the blog page on the dermnppa.org. Great. So I guess I'm open to questions as well. Excellent. So the questions will be coming in. We're going to um, transition the host back to um, Stacy uh, to collect questions, I think, and then uh, we'll read them off unless you wanted to collect them through the chat. So we did have one question from the previous section as we're going through this transition. Uh, this was uh, for Dr. Keo. Uh, Dr. Keel, what is the game plan in a practice 
if a staff member has, act has actually tested positive for COVID once the practice has reopened? Yeah, right now we've been fortunate. We have not had that event happen. If someone is positive for it, they will obviously not come to work. Uh, until there's true antibody testing, they look at their level of uh, defense against it. They will not be allowed back to work. Yeah, and would that be a 14-day uh, quarantine for that patient? Yes, it would. Yeah. So that would be important HR with the health department too, being a reportable case. We'd ask them what would be the next step. We, I'll take it back. We actually, we have had one physician I know of in the Knoxville area uh, that had it and has recovered, minor illness and recovered. He did stay out for two weeks uh, and is back at work doing well. So that's in an affiliated group uh, here in Knoxville. Yeah, I think it's going to be really important to determine some protocols within practices that are very clear. Um, and that's going to, uh, you can follow CDC guidelines, but I think individual practices may also have, uh, and hopefully the AAD may publish some guidance for us as well in terms of testing. I think uh, we always talk about testing and how all roads lead to testing. And you know, hopefully all healthcare providers and staff will have access to testing as you know even you know in dermatology we as some of the primary symptoms of COVID are turning out to be skin manifestation uh, we should you know as frontline providers in that essence have uh, hopefully get access for us and our staff as well. Yes look at your your state and local health departments I know the state of Tennessee is putting out uh, 16 different testing centers this weekend for free testing. Uh, we have not initiate any plan for our clinic to have everybody go down there and be tested. Uh, we're holding off on that, but a lot of states, local uh, governments are holding uh, testing, free testing areas. I know Tennessee has 16 going on this weekend. Great, thank you. So Dr. Markowitz, uh, we're getting uh, multiple questions about the cost and reimbursement of the DermTech uh, PLA. Um, the questions are surrounding whether it's covered or not. It's covered. Okay, so it's, it's covered. It's covered by insurance. In my office, uh, sometimes there is an associated copay. Um, it's never been uh, more than fifty dollars. Uh, but as I mentioned, at least virtually, the majority in, in New York, for sure, uh, the copays are completely waived. So it's not really a cost to the patient um, at all, basically. In California, we have that same, we have the ability to perform the test and it's un, at no cost to the patient. Uh, there's another question that um, is wanting clarification about whether the test can be done in the office. And yes, it can. And uh, many of us are, have been and are doing it on a daily basis for our patients in clinic. Um, but also um, for the purposes of telemedicine, um, this test can be delivered to the patient's homes as Dr. Markowitz uh, described. And then uh, we get on, once it's received by the patients, we get on the phone with the patient and um, help them administer the tape stripping, if you will, the yes. specimen collection. Yes, um, I, I utilize uh, this technology every day in my clinical practice. And now, of course, I'm utilizing it uh, frequently uh, virtually as well. And uh, I have my staff uh, contact the patient to walk them through. Um, and then uh, the, the initial visit is with me and at times the follow up as well. Um, so yes. And then the, uh, another question about how do you get trained uh, as a provider to perform this test? Um, so for training, uh, the company has been really forthcoming. Uh, in walking myself and my staff uh, through the various steps. And uh, then in office, I you know, created uh, a video to also help guide my patients. Um, but there are videos that the company has available as well online uh, that patients can watch. It's, uh, it, it's a pretty straightforward procedure and they've been really accessible in helping. Yeah, it seems... Um there are a tremendous amount of assets. We'll make them available. Uh, we'll make we'll put some links up on our um, 
BedermMPPA.org on the blog um, so that you can, if you're not using the test now, you can contact the company and they can um, provide you with the test and training necessary as well as all of the assets that you can use to train your staff and then your staff can use to train patients. So at this point, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions coming in. Um, I just want to take an extra moment or two to thank uh, Dr. Keo for sharing it, your new look practice with us. Uh, much more well done than I've seen in the supermarkets. It really looks actually quite nice. It's hard to tell that it wasn't done with the cosmetics in mind. So I hope to visit with you again soon and catch up and see how things are working as we will all, I hope, uh, experience a surge of patients back into our practice. And Dr. Markowitz, thank you for taking time and sharing your expertise with us to help us um, build the tools of our virtual lab coats so we can really be able to maximize the level of care that we can treat our patients with uh, virtually. So in closing, um, we want to thank everyone for joining us again this evening. Uh, we're going to continue to host these uh, weekly video series uh, with updates on our continuing, our uh, evolving uh, world as it is. Uh, we hope to see everyone again next week. In the meantime, please email us at info at uh, for any topics of interest that you'd like us to cover next week or questions that you have. And then please continue to check out the website um, look on the blog page and our social media as well. Tomorrow we will be sending out an e-blast uh, with access to this talk as well as many other resources that were mentioned tonight. And um, those will be available for you on the website. So everyone, please uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And um, we hope to see uh, everyone live next week in Las Vegas. Oh, not, not next week. Let me uh, research that. Uh, my mom was waving at me. <laughs> um, so we hope to see everyone in August, hopefully if everything goes well and travel is allowed and yeah, the wind and the encore uh, can provide uh, adequate social distancing and a sanitized environment, we'll be able to host uh, Durham 2020 live in Las Vegas, uh, August 6th to August 9th. So with that, we've come to the end. Thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the evening.